Welcome everybody. I'm sitting here with uh, James Grenning and Ari van Benneken, both of them co-authors of the Agile Manifesto. And it's a rare occasion because uh, it's not very often that we have two or more of uh, the co-authors of the Agile Manifesto. So, James, Ari, I'd like to know, uh, what was your reason to participate in the Agile Manifesto? Was there something specific that you wanted to make clear? Well, do you know where the Agile Manifesto was held? You don't mind me asking a question back to you? Yeah, in, uh, I know it was in America, in Snowbird. And do you know what Snowbird is? No. It's an amazing ski resort. So, I'll just tell the truth. As I always do on this topic, I went to go skiing. <laughs> <laughs> and, and had a great time with none of the uh, people I respected uh, that I was learning a lot from at that time. Nice. And some good uh, skiing on the mountains. The, the weather was perfect. Yeah. The, they're known worldwide for their powder, and they did not disappoint. We were snowed in for several days, and uh, the snow came down. It was avalanche conditions. It was beautiful. Okay, great. And Ari, were you there for the skiing, or did you have ulterior motives? Yeah, I had another motive. Um, I, was, I was working in Europe, uh, as you might know, uh, very much involved in the DSDM community, and uh, we were sort of chapter organized and we were thinking about bringing a chapter into North America and Dane Faulkner who was actually uh, has an apartment in Snowbird uh, was supposed to be uh, the chair of the chapter in North America and he just gave a call he knew about the session that's going to be held and he said can you bring someone in and then Mary Hansen from the DCM Consortium back office she gave me a call and at that moment in time if I had an opportunity that I could talk about DCM the different ways of working and focusing on the interaction instead of on you know, document streams. I took the opportunity, so I did the same thing. I took the opportunity. Uh, Robert Martin and I are good friends for a long time, for maybe uh, nearly 20 years before that. And we were working together at the time, and we were learning a lot from Kent Beck, Lord Cunningham, Ron Jeffries, Martin Fowler. We had a uh, relationship with them. And so the opportunity came up to go hang out with them, and it was at Snowbird. So it was like a very easy decision. In 1999 at uh, Object Mentor, we had uh, Kent Beck demoing test-driven development, and it struck me as uh, an amazing thing. It's like we could actually write software in this incremental way and uh, test it as we go rather than uh, plan it all out, write it, test it later. The day after seeing Kent do that, uh, I went back to one of my clients that I was helping with design, and we started trying to find ways to write code sooner and to start uh, test driving our code, what's called test first programming at that time. Uh, it fit really well with the design uh, principles and knowledge which uh, we had at Object Mentor, Bob Martin's company, it felt, felt, felt really good and fit really well with that. And so I started coaching the next Monday. Um, Ari, for you, what was, what was uh, for you before the Agile Manifesto, mm. uh, what was your path and what was it afterwards? Well, I would like to take it from James where he said about testing as we go. Uh, I was, uh, I, I got into my, to my career in uh, 1987 as a developer, was doing this work as a, on a, a, let's say on a Dutch governmental agency uh, in uh, 1994 and I got upset about the way they worked and you could see the waste of money while we were doing it uh, no value in there so value has been my drive and the question is how do you, how do you bring value i got an opportunity in mid 1994 to start working with a, a method with a team and a pilot with the royal navy called rapid application development and this is where we sort of develop testing as we go but then on the value side so close collaboration with the actual business sitting side by side in regular sessions okay is this really helping you because in you know the situation where we live today complex situations complex solutions having a detailed design up front is almost impossible or is impossible so this is where it started for me you know being upset about the waste of public money trying to find different ways of doing it um there's a lot of common sense in it. i we were just talking about it before the interview in the late 80s i was pairing they didn't know we called it pairing, but I was pairing because it made sense to do so. Uh, but it got more structured in 1994 and on. I got actively involved in the communities. Rapid Application Development had the RUC, the Rapid Application Development User Groups. 
they were together owning the intellectual property of the DSDM, got into the DSDM community. On behalf of the DSDM community, I was participating in the session in Snowbird. And since then, for me, it has been a continuously evolving journey where the last you know, 15 years have been quite, how can you do, you know, how can you help organizations to become agile? Because in my opinion, if you work agile, that's the only way to survive the future, where change and the pace of change and innovation is only increasing and never decreasing again. And it took an insightful uh, Kent Beckett World Penny and go, well, you know, once you have it, you start to change it. So get good at dealing with change. We're trying to make people freeze their ideas of what it is. And uh, it became very, uh, well, like I said, uh, freeing to uh, look at design and work that way. And uh, I think like you, I was working with a, a company who really uh, valued thinking about software rather than actually writing it. They would waste a whole year. Yeah, yeah, yeah exactly, it. yeah. And they were like kind of shocked that we could actually do something meaningful in two weeks cycles. Yeah. Uh, I remember uh, leaving that meeting and we kind of all thought, well, you know, oh, the award said that he would put it up on the website somewhere. And, I, you know, my thought was no one's going to care. And, uh, and it started to grow, and uh, kind of surprising that it grew. <laughs> We're not there yet, right? And I think we we started something, uh, and remember that I was representing a full community, right? It was not just me. There were a lot of people already trying to identify how can we improve what we do. Uh, we're not there yet, uh, and and what I hope uh, is that people see this as entering the world of continuous improvement and change instead of, you know, in the past it was, okay, what for, this is how we do it, yet Q, QA manuals and this is how we work, or one fixed state and then, okay, now we've got to agile, so we're going to do the next fixed state, and agile is not a fixed state, it's, it's a mindset where you go into continuous learning, continuous improvement, and um, uh, I hope it, it, people will get this rationale that this is what's needed to make it successful, I'm, I'm sort of, you know, still surprised by by people who try to make it into the next state of how we are. Yeah, I'd say that's, uh, that is kind of the, the core of Agile is improvement. Yeah. And what the world is doing is following a new dogma. I, I saw a statement from, I, it's supposed to be from Vincent Churchill, it was in one of my clients on the wall. And it says, uh, perfection is not a state, perfection is an ambition. Mm -hmm. And if you want to reach that ambition, you have to change a lot. So being perfect means that you change a lot. And what I see is that a lot of people, you know, they give themselves a new position in the outer world and they try to, to protect it from change as much as they can. And this is where we totally go wrong. So I hope we can get a can achieve Human that nature. one. Yeah. Yeah, yeah, I think so. Right? Now, this is something you see um, every day, whether you're going from waterfall to agile or from trying to introduce new ways of working, new methodology. Is this a psychological uh, barrier with some of the adoption? Are there um, anything that, you know, do you have any advice on how, how do you overcome some of those things? I, I used to think in the early days of uh, bringing this stuff to uh, systems engineers or any engineers was uh, if we just show them, we could convince them. Right? My job was to convince someone it was a good idea pretty quickly discovered that I couldn't convince anyone. Um, what I had to do instead is think of, you know, what appealed to it to me? And as an engineer, what I want to do is I want to know what problem I'm solving. And so uh, to get people interested in something like test-driven development, I had to describe, you know, why you might want to do it, what problem that you want to solve. And there's a lot of different positive benefits that you might get. Uh, but one is what problem are you trying to solve? And then uh, in my my work, what I try to do is give people an opportunity to convince themselves. So I can't convince anyone, but I could set up a situation where they might be able to experience the thing that they can convince themselves. You know, so I, I think there's just this natural resistance. People think they know how uh, the best way to do something. They've learned something difficult to do. Programming is, is not an easy thing. Uh, they've learned how to do it, and um, you know, what's wrong with how I do it? Okay, well, nothing, but maybe you could what you've learned has been important. Uh, do you experience these problems, like chasing defects or dealing with bad code? Hmm. Yes, I do. Well, then maybe you're interested in trying something else. If I may add to this, because you know, you, in the late 90s, you do a couple of projects at the same client side. That same client is always in trouble, always running late, always unhappy business. So you do three projects in a row, everybody happy. 
So you can get this loose one. So the next one they're going to do it like this, and you have to fight to to go for the same success again. And I thought, why, why, why is this happening? And later on, I found out if you go to agile and working, there are a couple of things that are really a paradigm change. You know, paradigm is perception. And one of the perceptions, for example, is testing something that you do at the end. Just an example. Um, and so many like documentation standards, decision making processes, how many, you countless managers decide on what requirements to take into a solution. Managers never use a solution. It's the people, you know, that, you, so ask those in. So the big problem in agile working is the paradigm shift. And the paradigm shift is extremely difficult because I found out that paradigm change takes a while. And if you go into new ways of working, all paradigms are there and all paradigms define your reflexes on the stress. So people, before you know it, you bring in change and then they go back with the U-turn and they're back to where they were. And now today with the technology, you have less and less time to go back to where you were. But the paradigm change is a difficult one. That's, that's what I find. And there's a lot of pressure on people to keep uh, delivering the way they always did, no yeah. time to learn and improve. And if we don't spend some time improving, yeah, we're not going to be able to. You can go on a training, but you can do it in the evening hours, you know, in your own time. You know, yeah. that, that kind of right. thing. Yeah. 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 And that, that's the Instead paradigm. of having learning as part yeah. of the daily process with retrospectives, continuous improvement. Yeah. And actually being part of just your normal job. Yeah. Right. Now tell me, uh, what do you think is the future of Agile? Uh, where do you see it going? Well, there'll be a continuation of labeling what you do today with the word Agile in front of it. <laughs> that will, that will agile be, software. That, that will be the prevalent form of Agile. <laughs> okay. And uh, I have some evidence of that, which I'll, I'll give in my talk today. Yeah. But. Uh, um, unfortunately, there's that, okay? Some people are going to discover actual change and that at the core of Agile is continuous improvement. Uh, but unfortunately, I think I think that's a subset. And Ari, for you? Well, what I think, I, I was talking about the paradigm change yeah. earlier that you need you know, to really to become Agile as, as a department or as, a, as an organization. Um, so I think the future, you know, the future agile is not a word anymore, you know, five or ten years from now, it's sort of, okay, this is how we do it. There will be a lot of old paradigms in existing organizations, old organizations, and I think a lot of those old organizations, excuse my language, they will die. And the young organizations that are not suffering from a lot of, you know, paradigms, they will, they will just, you know, emerge and, and survive the future. That's my... So agile will become sort of a yeah, the word of generation of the current practice has to die so that the new practice can happen. Yeah, that kind of thing. Like washing yeah. hands for doctors. I think that was an example of that. Yeah, very, very, <laughs> very, very We're good too busy to wash our hands. So. <laughs> well, thank you both for joining us. Um, I'm going to update my thank CV you. to be agile interviewer. Uh, <laughs> thank you, everybody. Cheers.